All right, everyone. Let me stop sharing my screen because I think you know where you are or where you're supposed to be. Uh, I'm pressing the button, I'm sharing screen. Let me see. Ah, it's the red button. How about that? I know what I'm doing. I'm a pro. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. It is inauguration week, and I haven't breathed this easy in a long time. Uh, it's nice to have some adult supervision. Uh, so Happy New Year and welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I'm delighted to be your host. Now, uh, I'm a stand-up comedian and author, and if you are so inclined, you can find out more about me and my work at veryfunnylady.com. I am also co-host for Point of Inquiry, which is the podcast for the Center for Inquiry. Now, just a few reminders as we continue to wrestle with the pandemic, the Center for Inquiry's Coronavirus Resource Center is really doing the work of fact-checking this information and providing reliable news, which you can avail yourself of at Center of Inquiry, centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. Now this week, they've actually curated some interesting articles, which they do every week, but this week, uh, the FTC is warning about COVID-19 scams that are targeting small businesses, surprise, surprise. But the article that really gave me pause is uh, still going to the grocery store. With new virus variants spreading, it's probably time to stop. Oh dear, that was my only social outing. Uh, so read that one though, it's important. Uh, I also encourage you to subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer magazine and there are two ways to do that, digital and print. And the print subscription gives you access to the digital subscription, perfect. So go to skepticalinquirer.org and hit the subscribe button at the top right of your screen. I'm also going to go on ahead and ask you to mark your calendar for our next Skeptical Inquirer Presents, which is on February 4th, featuring Stephanie Kemmerer. She'll be breaking down the QAnon conspiracy theory for us. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to that because I just don't get it. But the flow of the evening is easy. You guys keep doing whatever you're doing. As always, you are doing great. And um, tonight is not a presentation, but a conversation, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and after which we will open it up for your questions. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's an icon that says Q&A. That is the place for you to type your questions in the form of a question. You know how we do here. And if you miss any of tonight, it is being recorded and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. Uh, and our guest this evening is a regularly contributing writer for The New Yorker, whose writing has won numerous awards, including the 2019 Excellence in Science Journalism Award. She is a New York Times bestseller and the author of The Confidence Game, Why We Fall for It Every Time, Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, and of course, the book of the evening, The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Now, while researching uh, The Biggest Bluff, our guest became an international poker champion and the winner of over $300,000 in tournament earnings and inadvertently turned into a professional poker player. That happens to people all the time, right? <laughs> she hosts a podcast, The Grift, which explores con artists, con artists and the lives they ruin. Her podcasting work earned her a National Magazine Award nomination in 2019. She is currently a visiting fellow at NYU's School of Journalism, and we are fortunate to have her here tonight because this woman is so super busy. So Maria Konnikova, welcome. I am so pleased to share the screen. How are you? Yay, I'm doing so well. How are you? I'm so happy this week. I, like you, have just, I've been suffering from insomnia, stress. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's oh, yeah. just, it's been, it's been just. Yeah, yeah. Counting it's, down it's, the minutes, the seconds. Literally, literally. <laughs> like, it's, it's been so bad that when I go to therapy, I ask my therapist, like, hey, you okay? How you doing? <laughs> and I'm sure your therapist actually answers. 
because yeah no we is... actually talked we were like girlfriends now yeah. we're like should i really give you a copay for this but whatever but I, I i wanted to share something with you before we really you know get started in earnest uh but my father taught me how to play poker he i love that poker. yes he taught me how to play poker when i was eight years old uh he wrote out um the the order of winning hands on an index card he gave me a set of poker chips and my mother was like less than thrilled that uh, my dad was grooming a little card shark <laughs> under his roof. Um, but my, my dad taught me um, that the real skill in cards and in life is, is not how you play a good hand, but how to play a bad hand well. I'm still learning, I'm still learning, but I gotta tell you your book is like the real in-depth part two supercharged lesson of that. Like my dad did the best he could with an eight-year-old, but this book is just so next level. And I, I told you, and I, I will say it again, I this was the best self-help book I ever read that I didn't know was going to be a self-help book. Because there are so many uh, concepts in here, so many gems, so many actionable steps that actually give people as you're taking you talking about your journey it's giving us like this way to to think about not just poker but how we discover who we are that's if you want to like you went on a journey you wanted to go on um and i i'm i'm so with you so for anyone who has not had the good fortune see what i did there I've not had the good fortune of reading <laughs> i did book. i saw that <laughs> It's very smooth, very smooth. Uh, if they haven't read your book, and everybody, if you have not read her book yet, wonderful investment. I I so endorse this. Um, but can you tell us what inspired you to write the book? Absolutely. So unlike you, um, I did not learn how to play poker when I was eight. <laughs> right. Although, I mean, I'm so glad you did because we can talk about this later. But one of the things I've come to believe is that children should be taught poker mm -hmm. because it's such an incredible life skill. And especially this is such a central skill for critical thinking, for critical analysis, mm -hmm. for being able to spot BS because it's it's a game that under makes you understand statistics and probabilities and people and emotions and makes you so much less susceptible to fake news and all of this disinformation that's out there. So I think that you were very lucky. You have a wonderful dad. I'm yeah. so I'm so thrilled to hear that he thought that this was a worthy investment because I just couldn't agree more. Um, Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you, you, you mentioned in the book that people recoil from that and you actually make the distinction between chess and poker. And I only bring that up because my, my dad taught my brother to play chess. He taught me to play poker. Now, I'm sure he was just picking an activity that, you know, he thought would work for each kid. He wanted to have something special for each of us. And I thought I missed out by not learning how to play chess. But you explained, and, I, and I, if I'm getting this correctly, that chess, everything is known. Everything's mm -hmm. on the board. Everything's right there. Poker, not so much. There's information you don't have and yet you still have to make decisions and you have to make that blend between what you know, what you don't know. And it's, it's, it's um, there, there's, there's skill involved, but there's also chance, which is what the whole book is about. That's exactly right. You understood that exactly in the, in the exact right way. And it goes back to your original question. Why did I end up embarking on this journey? Kind of what was, what was the origin behind it? And it could have been chess, but it wasn't for, for that very reason that chess is a game of perfect information. It's a beautiful game. It's a wonderful yes. game, yes. but it's a game that teaches you more about kind of analytical thinking and, and, being able to analyze things in that way rather than playing life because life is a game of incomplete information right. where you can't see the board. Just imagine chess if at any point any of the pieces all of a sudden could change and what you thought was a knight is now a rook mm -hmm. and what you thought was the queen is now a pawn and oh. what you thought was a black square was a white square. Just all of these things keep shifting. That's poker, that's life. Yes. Because life is a game where you don't know all of the variables and where chance plays a big role. And that's what got me into this game to begin with. I did not play poker growing up. I didn't play any games growing up. So my parents are wonderful. I love them dearly. And they valued 
reading. They weren't games mm. parents. We didn't even have a deck of cards. Oh. And so our, our uh, home activity was my dad would read to us. It was oh. something I still look, look back so fondly on that. It's wonderful, wonderful memories. Just having, hearing his voice, reading out loud, reading all of these wonderful stories, including Sherlock Holmes. That was actually the genesis of my first book um, okay. was him reading Sherlock Holmes to us. But I didn't really know what poker was, but something that I became more and more fascinated with as my life went on was the role of chance in our lives and how important it is to get lucky. And the fact that something that is so big in the United States, you know, the American dream is actually kind of BS. It's, kind this, of? <laughs> <laughs> it's this big mirage where you just think, oh, if I work hard enough, good things happen. That ain't true. No, it is not. There are so many people who work incredibly hard and they just, they, they didn't get lucky. And I'm someone, I was born in the Soviet Union and I came here when I was four years old. So I'm generation zero in the United States. Mm. And when I think about how lucky that was, I mean, I'm Jewish. And in the Soviet Union, back then it was the Soviet Union, I'm aging myself a little, but when I left, that was not Russia. The Iron, the Iron Curtain was still there. The Berlin Wall had not fallen. This was the oh, 80s. Wow. Okay. And no one knew that it was going to fall. I mean, mm, no one has that kind of foresight, right? It was kind of this thing where who knows how long it was going to last. And there were not many opportunities for Jews and Jewish girls. And I would certainly not be here with you today. Um, I would probably be a computer programmer because that's basically the only thing you can do. And I no, you know, this is what both of my parents do. They're ah, computer programmers okay. and okay. they're very, very good at it, but that's, that's kind of what you did. Um, and just thinking the luck that I had coming here, but then if you look at kind of my trajectory, I did good. I was kind of a model American dream, you know, went to Ivy League school, PhD in psychology, you know, going through all these things. And then when you think about it, I also got insanely lucky in order to be able to hit that. And I went through a period of my life where my luck didn't hold anymore. And all of a sudden, within a few months, all of these things happened at the same time. So I came down with an autoimmune disease that was never diagnosed, but yeah. I couldn't leave the house at all. Wow. Like I became allergic to wearing clothes. When I put anything on my body, I would erupt in hives and it was so painful that I just couldn't go outside. And so the medical response was to put me on these horse doses of steroids. And so then I just slept all day and I couldn't work. I couldn't write. I couldn't do anything. And they still didn't know what was wrong. They still don't. But Fingers crossed, um, it hasn't come back for a number of years. So hopefully, who knows, right? Something's yeah. lying dormant. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's funny when I heard that in your book, you know, they, yeah. they call it autoimmune disease when they don't know yeah. what it is. And it's like, oh my gosh, like that. Yeah. Do men get autoimmune disease or just this thing that they throw at women? I don't know. Right. Sometimes well, I think we medically get short shrift. And I, I could be do. totally wrong about that. Oh, we definitely do. That's a separate conversation. My sister, who's one of the most brilliant people I know who's an MD, PhD, and is a doctor. Um, she's a neonatologist. We've talked oh. about this together, and she talks about how women's health gets the short end of the stick, and women do get the short trip. That's a different conversation, but it is. It but is it's a, a it very important. But it's a very important one. But that happened. My grandmother died in a just total freak accident. She just slipped. She was totally healthy, oh, that's right. yes, living yes. on her own. She slipped, hit her head, and and that was it. And my mom lost her job. My husband lost his job. Just one thing after the other. And it just makes you realize you can work really hard, but you have to get really lucky. And yeah. those two things have to go hand in hand. And that's what I wanted to explore and write about and learn about so that at its heart, the biggest bluff was never going to be a book about poker. It was always going to be <laughs> oh, good job. poker. <laughs> poker as a metaphor for life, for these bigger questions, for 
this question of, you know, skill versus chance and the role of luck and how we can learn to tell the difference, how we can learn to get through the bad patches, yeah. um, how we can learn to maximize the good patches. Because as any poker player will tell you, in order to win, you need to play very well, but you also have to get insanely lucky. And you cannot win without the luck factor there as well. The great poker player knows this and also knows how to maximize skill and understand the role of luck. And so to me, this became, this journey became a way of just exploring all of these questions and all of these themes um, through a game that previously I had really no knowledge of whatsoever. I mean, I didn't. I did not know how many cards were in a deck, literally. I mean, the man who ended up becoming my mentor, my coach, Eric Seidel, who's one of the best poker players in the world and also just one of the best human. He's such a good person. And Um, a dragonfly. And a dragonfly, as you learn in my book, (laughs) yes. Um, So at the beginning, the first time I met him, um, we had, I'm surprised that he decided to take me on because I told him that, you know, I didn't know much about poker. I mean, I knew that there were 54 cards in a deck, but otherwise I didn't know much. And he just looked at, yeah, he had that look <laughs> in his face. Oh, no. And, he, and I, I said, what did I say? And he said, um, there aren't 54 cards in a deck. No. And that's when I realized I was a little bit wrong. Just a that was my starting wrong. point. You counted the box twice. I counted the jokers. Oh, the jokers. There you go. There you go. You can't do that. You can't do that. Now, I, I want to let everybody in, if you can, on the the, the inside, uh, I guess, joke of it, but not really. You you referred to him as a dragonfly. Why did you do that? Like, why why is it why a dragonfly? I thought that part of the that that description and why uh, it surprised me. I did not know. The, the story yeah. Of dragonflies. Well, it surprised me too, because I learned about dragonflies when I was writing this book and trying to figure out kind of different elements of, of what I was writing about. And so one of the things that you're always taught at the poker table is, you know, you want to be a shark, right? Poker is all about marine metaphors. So you've okay. got the fish and the fish right, are the right. ones who are the bad players. Then you've got the sharks and the sharks are the good players who eat the fish. Then you've got the whales and those are fish, but they have a lot of money. So they're just kind of these big things floating around and you want a whale at your table because it means they don't know how to play and they have a lot of money to lose. So I just thought, hey, you know, animal metaphors, interesting. And so I started wondering who's the best predator, kind of what what animal is the head of the animal kingdom. And immediately I was like, oh, you know, Eric's a lion or a tiger. And I started doing this research because that's what you immediately think of, right? When you think of predators, you think lion, tiger, wolf, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, But those types of big mammals that you watch on the nature channel and you see them stalking and you see them, you know, getting the gazelle and you're like, oh my God, wow, nature is violent. Um, So I started reading about that because that's the way my mind works. When I become interested in something, I just start reading a lot about it. And I learned that there are actually pretty bad predators when it comes to percentage of prey that they capture and that the single best predator in the animal kingdom is the lowly dragonfly that the dragon surprised I was shocked and that the dragonfly is so precise and is not only able to capture its prey but the reason it does it as often as it does is that it can anticipate motion its eyes have evolved in a way that it knows what its prey is going to do before the prey knows oh. to me that was just like you know the the mind blown emoji with like the brain yeah, yeah that, that that's what i felt like i was it made me absolutely obsessed with dragonflies and i realized that that was the single best image for eric because nobody realizes how deadly and how powerful and how prescient an animal the dragonfly is. Mm -hmm. We think of it as, you know, you just look at it, it's tiny. No one gives it a second thought and just kind of swat it away. It can be kind of annoying when you're sitting outside and you don't want any flies around and that's about it. And yet it's such a phenomenal 
not only predator, but I don't know what, what we say, wizard, who knows, who knows the future. And to me, that was just perfect because if you think about someone like Eric, he does not, he is so self-effacing. He's so humble. People forget he exists when they think of the best poker players of all time because he does not blow his own horn and he does not tell people how great he is. And normally when people ask him who kind of the best poker players are, not only does he not name himself as one of them but he says oh you know I'm probably I'm much worse than all these 50 players I I'm still learning I don't even know if I'm good and you see all these other players who are like oh I'm the best I'm number one (laughs) you know I'm 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 the guy (laughs) and uh they're the they're the peacocks and to me the contrast was so powerful Oh, no, no, certainly. I, and I guess it also stood out to me because I'm incredibly bug phobic. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the horror movie that needs to be made that I will never see. Because I, I, I think you said, and I can't remember which animal, but I, I guess maybe it was one of the cats that it gets maybe 50 or 60 percent of the prey that it aims for. The dragonfly gets 99. So you're, <laughs> you're kind of done for, you know, there's no fly <laughs> trap that's going to help you. No. But, but you you mentioned the the, uh, the 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 peacock guys and that and so I guess it's it, we really should mention how and, and everybody knows this but we'll say it how um, poker is a male dominated field. Uh, there are women there, but you know not in the same sort of numbers. And that you kept that in mind when you started playing online poker. Uh, what was your online name and why did you pick it? Because it I felt I felt there was like a lot of psychology that went into that. I'm like, she's using that PhD for sure. <laughs> there was, there was. So yeah, I mean, the fact that poker is 98% male is just a mind, mind-boggling number because it means you can go for days and days and days in live poker and never encounter another woman. Wow. And I started off playing online because... Eric had told me that it was the best way to get in a lot of experience very quickly. I live in New York. Um, You can't play online poker in New York. So every day I would reverse commute to New Jersey (laughs) where you can play online poker, Um, which by the way, just makes no sense whatsoever. Let me just throw that out there. Um, It's just completely illogical. But anyway, um, I, before I started playing, I thought, well, how do I recreate some of the psychological factors that come from being female live? How do I recreate that online? And so I thought long and hard about my screen name and decided on the psych chick, which was a way of pointing out, you know, there was a psychology background, chick says female um, Mm -hmm. but psych chick together kind of looks like psychic maybe if you're not looking too uh too closely and then I made my avatar my my little photograph was a puppy um because you know little yeah yeah. harmless cute exactly so I decided to have that be my online persona and I did not realize how well it would work because people immediately assumed I was female. And there are chat functions on the online poker site and they chatted (laughs) and- They said sweet, wonderful things, didn't they? Yes, they did. They (laughs) did. They told me how wonderful I was and how glad they were to be seeing a female (laughs) puppy on on their poker site. Um, they did call me female dog many times and, and a lot of other things, but it was, it was a really interesting way of not only recreating some of those live dynamics, but also seeing what people were provoked to do Mm -hmm. when they thought that I was kind of this harmless puppy female and it ended up netting me, I think, a lot of money because people would get mad. And then I ended up after the fact, looking at some psych research um, and finding that 
there have been studies done uh, on online poker with male versus female avatars. And it turns out that people bluff a lot more against females than they do against males. But when you tell them that they do that, they get mad at you and they say that you're wrong. They say it doesn't apply to them. They refuse to acknowledge it. Everybody's different. It's not me. And yeah, no, I, I, I totally get it. I was um, pr- particularly uh, sort of incensed for you um, when you introduced us to the character of uh, AIA. Uh, <laughs> Aggressive idiot asshole. Yes, yes. I was as enraged as you probably felt. And it's like, ah, this guy, I know this guy. I probably dated this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, haven't we all? Uh, sadly sadly but yeah there are a lot of sort of that that male energy and you you know you really captured it when you you told us what a bsd is um the 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 big swinging dick you know oh that, yes that, that energy and i as soon as i heard that and i'm like and i and i've you know i've heard that sort of thing before but i'm like is there a feminine form of that you know can we have the high flying uterus like what do we get yeah i mean so i stole the term big swinging dick from michael lewis um so michael lewis before he started writing about everything under the sun wrote a book called liar's poker which was autobiographical. It was about his time on the trading floor of Solomon Brothers back when Solomon Brothers was still a thing. I mean, Solomon Brothers no longer exists. Um, And he had noticed that there were these guys on the trading floor who were the big swinging dicks. They were the ones who could basically do anything because they brought in the money. And once you brought in a certain amount of money, the world was your oyster. And his one career ambition, I mean, talk about changing careers, he ended up quitting and becoming a writer. But his one career ambition at the time was to be a big swinging dick himself. And he had the term for females, there weren't many females, but I think there were one or two on the floor. And he called them big swinging dickettes. (laughs) So he (laughs) he changed, yes, he added the et to it. So I think you're right. Yeah, that's so much better. That's great. We need a different term. But I remember reading that book and having that term stick in my mind because I was like oh my god that's right Pete there are the guys that are the big swinging dicks and I hadn't thought about it for a long time and then I entered the world of poker Mm. and all of a sudden all of a sudden I mean the dicks were swinging everywhere (laughs) sorry sorry. (laughs) but it was just that was kind of the prevailing ethos and I just thought what the hell is this? And it also took me a while to realize that the big swinging dicks weren't the best players. They weren't the best, the players with the best cards, but they were the players best capable of projecting this masculine testosterone filled confidence and trying to bully me. And at the beginning I fell for it. And that made me actually like, that was not a very pleasant thing to find in myself because I'd like to think that I'm a strong female and poker taught me otherwise. It taught me that I actually can be bullied, that I have internalized a lot of these stereotypes that are set forth by society because to be successful while female, you can't be a big swinging dick. You can't project that energy. The moment you do, you get judged for it. You don't get rewarded for it. You don't get promoted for it. And yeah, no, sorry, you, I see you, that you want to say something, no, and I, so no, I really I just, want to I let you uh, interject. That, that part you quoted, I can't remember who the the lady from Harvard who actually studies negotiating while female. And, Hannah and Riley Bowles. Was, thank you, thank you, and that we're penalized for for doing that. The very same thing that men are praised for, you know. Yep. So we have to figure out a way to do it. You know, it's it's it, it just it's yeah as if being a woman isn't isn't you know hard enough it's so easy yeah and in poker when you actually let those internalized stereotypes go forth and have the have their say you start losing money you bleed money because that's not the way to play and when you're not projecting confidence no one believes you and when you let yourself be bullied because you want to avoid conflict you lose money. And so I had to go through a pretty hard learning process when I realized that, wow, you know, I do do some of these things and let some of these things happen. How do I change that? 
how do I actually use the big swinging dick energy against them? How do I figure out how to turn that on its head? And the moment I started realizing how hollow that energy was a lot of times and how much they've relied on my reaction in order to be able to kind of perpetuate that, I was able to use it against them and use the fact that I don't care. You know, I don't care how people see me at the end of the day. You know, you know what? I don't care if you see me as a big swinging dick. When I realized that, I was able to start playing back and start using some of their own stereotypes about women against them. You know, do you think that a woman is incapable of bluffing? That she's incapable of pulling these moves? Well, to me, that's a huge advantage because if you don't think I'm capable of doing something, let me start doing it because then right. you'll you'll believe me because you don't think I can do it. You underestimate me. But if you're the type of person who would rather die than be bluffed by a woman, okay, well, all of a sudden my strategy is going to be totally, totally different because I will never bluff you because you're going to call me with anything. I will instead extract maximum value from you because I know that your delicate ego can't bear the thought of folding your cards to me because I'm a girl. <laughs> and so once you kind of, once you start realizing what those, some of those stereotypes are, they can be very powerful. It's never pleasant, by the way. Um, that's kind of a part of poker that I hope will change. I hope that it won't be 98% male in 10 years. I hope that more women will get into the game. I hope that some of those dynamics will shift um, because you know it's never, it's never pleasant to be propositioned at a table, which has happened to me and oh. told what my hourly rate is going to be when I accompany a gentleman up to his hotel room. That's not nice. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, so, so we can do without that, but otherwise I think we can, uh, learn to use some of those biases against people because that's not optimal play. That's not the way they should be playing. That's just them being aggressive in a way that takes advantage of me. and understanding that that's that's why poker is such a powerful game when you're talking about life because life is all about those dynamics and all about the human elements it's not just about the math and the statistics and what your correct frequency here should be because you've actually done the analysis and you know you should be bluffing here 30 percent of the time great it's great to know that that's the uh that that's the baseline frequency but if this guy will never fold to me, I should bluff 0%. If this guy will always fold because he will think that I'm just never bluffed, then I should bluff much more, right? So it's all about these evolving dynamics. It's, it's the math and the human, which makes it so beautiful. That's why yeah. John von Neumann, the father of game theory, who was a poker player himself, that's why he fell in love with poker and used poker as the model for game theory. Because this man who was a brilliant mathematician, um, one of the kind of polymaths of the 20th century, father of the computer, um, father of the hydrogen bomb. And he understood that it wasn't just math, that you needed the human because life was about the merging of the two. Life was about having that base knowledge of the probabilities and the statistics and all of that, but then layering the human interaction on top of it. And that's what you need to be able to do in order to win, in order to succeed. Um, and that's the beauty of poker. Beautifully said. Um, you, you talked about um, in the book, and you touched on it here a little bit, about how, you know, there's a lot of time spent on learning your opponent and what are they thinking and what are their biases and what are their buttons? And then reaching that moment of, well, what are mine? You know, who, who am I? 
you know, what, what you, you're spending 12, 14 hours at the table, you know, if you're playing seriously and how, what are you like when you get tired? What are you like when you're hungry? What are you like when you're frustrated? What, what are your, you know, biases? What do you, it's all that comes out and you can't hide it. And so you have to know you at, or put in as much time learning you as you are other people. So I'm leading up to, can you, can you tell us what a bad beat is? Yes, absolutely. So a bad beat is when statistically speaking, you are the favorite to win. So you have the best hand and you get your money in as a favorite. So for people who don't play poker, that means that when all the chips go into the middle and when you've placed all your bets and you turn your cards over, you should win. But there are a few cards left to come. And one of those cards, or maybe there's one card left to come, it could be one or two when you're talking about No Limit Hold'em, which is the variant that I most often play. One of those cards does not go against, it does not go in your favor and instead hits your opponent and they luck out or in poker terms, suck out. So you were the <laughs> overwhelming favorite, but they end up winning. So, you know, if they had one card in the deck that could make their hand and they hit it, all of a sudden you lose all of your money. Did you make the right decision? Absolutely. You were an overwhelming favorite. Did you get unlucky? Absolutely. You were an overwhelming favorite, but you lost. And so bad beats are an everyday part of poker where you do the right thing. You do the right analysis. You do everything right. You make the right decision and you lose. And if you don't have bad beats happen to you, that actually means you're not taking enough risk. Mm. You're not putting yourself out there. A bad beat can be a wonderful thing because it means I made, I keep making the right decision. I keep putting myself in a position to get lucky. And sometimes I get unlucky. If you never suffer a bad beat, that means that you basically never get your money in and you never right. take that risk. And it's one of these things where anyone who plays poker has lots of bad beat stories. All oh, these times when I had, mm -hmm. you know, I had aces and the other guy had kings. For people who don't play poker, kings are not as good as aces. Right. Aces are the best hand you can have. We got it all in and then he hit a king and he took my money and it's horrible. I can't believe it. And these are stories are total drag. You don't wanna be listening to them. Um, but people tell them all the time and people wallow in them and people just mm -hmm. let them be the kind of the entirety of their existence. And I have a personal story where I did the same thing. So I was very early in my poker career. It wasn't a career at that point. I was just, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> I was just learning how to play. And I was in Las Vegas and I was in a tournament and I Almost. So I'd been losing a lot of money because I hadn't been cashing in any tournaments. People had been knocking me out. And finally, I was this close. The next person out would be out with zero, but then the person after that would make money. And I had the best hand ever. And I was so excited because I knew that this was going to be my first tournament in cash. And I was so proud. And so you know, we got all our money in and we flipped over our cards and I was the favorite and I was so excited already counting, you know, counting that money and bad beat. I ended up knocked out of the tournament because mm -hmm. my opponent hit his miracle card and that was that. And so I ran to my coach, Eric, mm -hmm. and I started telling him this story. And he's, like I said, the nicest guy in the world. And he just looked at me and he said, shut up. <laughs> and my jaw dropped. I thought, what? What? you're you're my coach. You're supposed to listen to me. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Come on. And he said, and I'll never forget this. He said, do you have a question about how you played the hand? And it made me stop. And I said, well, I guess not. You know, I had the best hand and I had best hand possible. No one could have beaten me at that point. Um, and I got my money and he said, that's it. That's the end of your story. The only thing I care about is the decision process. Do you have a question about how you played? If the answer is yes, let's talk about it. Mm 
Let's talk about how you made the decision because that's skill. That's what you have control over. I don't care how the hand ended. I don't care who won because that doesn't matter. That's chance. The rest of the cards after the money goes in the middle, that's not up to you. That's pure variance. That's luck. No one can control that. And it does not matter. And he told me a few things then. He said, first of all, when you tell a bad beat story, it's like taking your trash and dumping it on someone else's lawn. Right. It was such a powerful, I just kind of thought about it. I said, wow, <laughs> you don't want to do that. He said, and it was so true because it's trash. It's toxic to you because it's the wrong thing to focus on. You made the right decision. If you get your money in as a favorite, you've won, even if you lose, because you made the right decision. You did, you performed the right decision analysis. Your calculus was dead on. You read the situation correctly. If it didn't go against you, if it didn't go for you, if it went against you, well, that's not your fault. You should do the same thing over and over and over because eventually, if you keep putting yourself in that position of being such a favorite, you're going to win and you're going to make money if you're playing poker. And if you're in a life situation, you're going to get lucky. But if you focus on the outcome instead, that wasn't that it had nothing to do with how you thought about it, right? The outcome is chance. So what happens if you made the right decision and you got your money in as a favorite and then you keep dwelling on the fact that you were beaten, that you lost? Does that make you too cautious in the next round? Does it make you not make the right decision because you remember that time you lost? And instead you should just be focusing on making the same decision because it was chance, it was a bad beat and good, good thing it was a bad beat. And so he made me realize and he made me promise to never again tell him how a hand ended. He told me, I don't care what the outcome is. I don't care if you win or lose. I just want to hear the process of thinking. How did you think about this situation? And it actually, it frees up so much mental space. It frees up so much emotional energy to just not dwell on it and instead move on immediately and say, okay, that happened, moving on. What's my situation now? What am I working with here? How am I going to move forward rather than say, oh, my God, look at everything I've lost because poker chips don't have a memory. Poker cards don't have a memory. Life doesn't have a memory. It doesn't know what it just happened. It doesn't care about you in statistics and probabilities. They don't care who you are. They don't care what just happened. Right. It's it's math. It's yeah. it's. That's you mentioned that in the book. It's like, you think you're due and chance doesn't work that way. Chance is not looking in, in the notebook going, oh yeah, Leanne's due. She's had a run of bad luck. Time to change that. That's not how it works, even though Leanne, our, you're that's due. how our minds. You're due. <laughs> oh, of course. Well, if you say it, I believe it. But I, 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 I got to tell you of all the things that resonated for me in the book, it was that bad beat and to not be a bad beat dweller. And you, you did this throughout the book. You would, you would take a, a concept that you learned either, either from Eric or from, from someone else. And it was a poker lesson, but it, then it became a personal lesson. Cause if you're not, if you're doing that, at, if you stop doing it at the table, you, or you realize you're doing it at the table, well, then you would, you would always ask, well, where am I doing that in life? Yeah. And it's, you would, so... you would, it's a beautiful extrapolation. And, and I got to tell you that not only hit home for me, it moved into my house and sat in the good chair. And I, it, I really, I said, wow, I'm a bad beat dweller. That's what I do. And I dump my trash on my friend's lawn and call myself a friend because I'm sharing all this woe is me. And I'm like, look at all that energy. Instead of thinking, okay, what, like you said, what could I control? What can I not? What is there to learn? How do I go forward? What's the lesson here? So much of a better use of my time. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I really love that. Yeah, it, that, that makes me very happy because I think that that's actually one of, if not the most powerful thing that I took from poker was the fact that we should be spending our energy on the things that we can control rather than dwelling on the things that we can't. We need to learn to differentiate the two and figure out, okay, well, what can I control? I can control myself. 
I can control my actions. I can control my reactions. I can control mm -hmm. my emotions. These are things that are within me to change. I can, I can actually do that. I can't control what happens in the future. I mean, that's just, I can't, certainly can't control the past. That's already happened. Can't control other people or their reactions or their actions. So let me focus on me. Let me actually invest my mental energy, my emotional resources, because those are finite. It's yes. not like we have an infinite capacity to focus on the world, right? There's, there's a limit there. How do I best deploy my brain? How do I best deploy my energy? And I think the answer has to be focusing on the things that you can actually change. It's something that a lot of people have asked me over the last year, you know, as we're all dealing with lockdowns and quarantines. And, you know, up until up until yesterday, these <laughs> forces that seemed like, oh, my God, the world's gonna end. Yes. And yes. it's important to realize that but not to dwell on it in the sense of it's hopeless, right? Instead, right. try to figure out, okay, what are the things I can do? How can yes. I make a difference? What are the tiny things? I'm just one human being. You know, what are the tiny actions that I can take to try to change the tide on some of these things rather than dwell on the, on the, on the features and the factors and the people that I can't control and just spend all of my time being angry Instead, mm. let me see what I can do. Anger is yeah. a powerful fuel. It can give yes. you, it can make that and, engine flow. And it's addictive. If that's your go-to, that feels yeah. comfortable and it can get hard to change. Yes, but then what do you do? What right. can I do that's positive that can actually make a difference? And this is actually a huge difference um, going back to poker between good and bad poker players. They're the poker players who just always dwell on the ways that they were wronged and the ways that they, you know, the breaks they didn't get and the way that luck broke against them. And then there are the players who just learn and study and say, okay, you know, this happened. What can I do? How can I improve? I can't change variants. I can't change that. I can't change whether I'm running good or bad. What I can change is my caliber as a player, how I study, how I go mm -hmm. forward and do things. And I think taking that attitude into your everyday life and into poker, I, it just, it bears dividends because it makes you I think more complete, more emotionally resilient, better able yes, to yes. actually kind of rise up when you have bad beats dealt to you in life. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy. I mean, it's so easy to just dwell in feeling bad for yourself. Oh, yeah. And yeah. That's it's, my it's... PhD. I'm a dweller, <laughs> everybody. I, 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 I have to tell you, I, I, I'm, I'm going to share this with you. I think you'll like this. I just A text popped up on my phone. One of my friends said, hey, what was that poker book you mentioned that was about life? <laughs> So that's how much I've been talking about you. My friends are like, I should get this book. Uh, but I, I, I realize I'm also, uh, I am fangirling and being a little selfish uh, with your time. I've got some questions for, for you from uh, folks who uh, have come to the webinar. So I want to try to get to a few of those if you don't mind. Sure, of course. Um, David uh, Clutchman, if I'm seeing that correctly, um, he wants to know what software tools do you use, if any, solved Bluezilla, Cards Runner, EV. Do these sound familiar to you at all? <laughs> um, I use PO Solver. Um, so yeah, I okay. do use some software tools. So this mm -hmm. is what you and I were talking about earlier on about kind of the human versus the mathematical. So I do think I am not a math person. My math, my math ended in high school. Um, senior year, that was my last math class. And I'm so glad I was like, I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I don't <laughs> yes, need this shit. <laughs> exactly. That was my undergrad degree. Journalism and creative writing. I can use a calculator. I'm good. Exactly. <laughs> and everything just went out the window. I forgot all of it. And so one of my biggest worries when I started this project was the math. And wow. I remember telling Eric that, you know, I don't, I count on my fingers. I still count on my fingers, by the way. So if you ever see That's me at the poker table, you'll likely see my fingers going <laughs> like that. That's why you got fingers. And yeah, that's me calculating pot odds and that's the way I am. And I've never been able to shake that. And that's just the way I count. But I was very nervous. And he said, you know, that's fine to be a good poker player. You really just need 
rudimentary math. If you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, you'll be fine. And I was like, ah, oh, I think I can. I got to try to. Anyway, I've become much better at mental math since I've started playing poker. But there's a school of thought that uses kind of just pure mathematical approaches to playing. And there are programs and there's software that now helps you try to figure out, well, what's the optimal strategy in any given situation? And at the beginning, I didn't use any of this because it was very overwhelming. And my edge was always going to be in the human, in the psychology. I mean, that's what I'm good at. And I think that's something that's very important to know is that everyone is different, right? So try to figure out what you're good at and where your strength lies, where your edge lies, and try to work on that. Don't try to be like other people. Because Mm -hmm. even if the entire poker world is going to math, but that's not your strength, you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. But what I learned is that as I got more serious about the game was that this was important and that I could use it in a way that worked for me. So yes, I do use software and I use PO Solver to actually help me figure out what other people are thinking and what my so-called baseline should be in certain situations so that then I, I just know what's going on and I can then use other things and psychology and kind of my understanding to work with it and play around with it and figure out what works for me. And the reason I I need it is because I am a new, even though I've now been playing for a few years, but still, I'm a new poker player. There are people who've been playing for decades and who've played so much more than I ever could. And in order to get some of that experience and to shortcut some of those things, I can use this mathematical stuff because it runs thousands and thousands of hands for me. And so basically that's the way that I'm plugging the the hole that I have of not having played for many years and not knowing, not having at my grasp kind of the, these situations mm-hmm. in the way that an experienced player would. The tools are the tools, I say. Exactly. And you just need to know how to use all of them, right? None of them are a godsend and none of them are the cure-all and like the golden standard, right? You just need to figure out how to use them for yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be dismissive. Be open-minded. Even if you're someone who thinks, oh, math isn't important still, it's important to actually consider it and use it. If you're someone who thinks that psychology isn't important, I would urge you to look at the psychology, stay open-minded, use the tools, but realize exactly what you said, Leanne, they're just tools. They're just Mm -hmm. part of your toolkit and you're going to use some of them more than others, depending on who you are. I, uh, I have a question from David. He's asked if, uh, if you play online, what's the different, what's the, what differences do you see between live and online? And uh, that's a whole hour long answer. It is, it it is, Um, it is. I do play online. Um, My edge is definitely live. Um, Online players, well, online, it's very different. You don't see people, right? You don't see the dynamics in the same way that you do in a live game. You don't see their body language. You don't see their expressions. And so I far prefer playing live. Um, And so just to give a short answer to me, live is always where it's at, but to a lot of people online is where it's at because it is much more mathematical and it is much more follow your strategy. That said, I think you can even use psychology online because things like I did, right? What's your screen name? What's your avatar? You know, what, how do you bet? How aggressive are you? I think these are all tools that we can use. And in some ways playing online is easier because you can use software that tracks a lot of the statistics about how people play for you live. You've got to do that yourself online. You can just say, Oh, how off, how aggressive is this person? Let me run this program that will tell me the frequency with which they open. Yep. And, and that is a huge, huge benefit. Um, So I think that that's, there are lots of differences, but ultimately I'm a live player, but online definitely gives you more experience. Okay. So there's, there's a balance, but you, there is a balance. I do. Um, Lewis wants to know, and I think this is an interesting question. I think it answers its own question in a way, but uh, are you sure there's such a thing as luck? Uh, the fall of the cards is the fall of the cards, but that's luck. But that's luck. 
I am sure that there's such a thing as luck. I think that there's just variance, kind of random noise, stuff that happens that you have no control over. In my mind, that's the definition of chance, right? The, the noise of the universe, the things that just oh, happen to us. The and the universe, that's perfect. I, <laughs> that's, and that's how I see it. And, and you can't control it. And that's why I get very mad when people define luck as things like, oh, well, luck is just preparation plus opportunity. And I want to say, no, that's not luck. There's, yeah, you need to be prepared and opportunities happen, but then there's luck. You know, luck is when I walk out the door, does a brick fall on my head, right? Yeah. Do I have a heart attack in the next second? That's luck. And that's not something that we can foresee. That's not something we have any control over. And no. that's not something that has any judgment on who we are. I also get very mad at people who say everything happens for a reason. Because oh. I think that sometimes that's one of my, I'm so glad, yeah. <laughs> Like, no, that is bullshit because sometimes really, really, really shitty things happen for no reason whatsoever. They just happen. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 it makes me angry too, uh, but I, I think I've tried to develop a little bit of compassion simply because humans, no, simply because humans have a hard time yeah. with random. We have a hard yeah. time with luck. You know, yes. we we, re we want something definitive. And, and as you said, poker, poker is about be becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. And humans aren't good at that. That's not at the top of our resume at all. So that's why we come up with these phrases. Oh, everything happens for everything. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, humans do need ways to deal with uncertainty and ways to deal with randomness. And I get that. But we also have to be careful not to judge and not to be yes. judgmental about others. And when you say something like everything happens for a reason, that can be very judgmental and say, yeah. well, you, you're not seeing the reason. Right. You know what? It's not up to you to say that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I'm so loving this conversation. And I, I know we're almost at the top of the hour, but I just want to try and get in because there's such good questions. Amy wants to know, and, and again, I, I, I haven't played poker in ages, but my dad also taught me how to play spades. And this comes in handy in spades all the time. So Amy wants to know, do you talk smack at the table or do you just remain quiet? Are you a trash <laughs> talker? You don't, you, don't, you don't impress me as a trash talker, but it's a good question. No, I'm not. I'm yeah, so whenever I'm playing, when I'm actually in a hand, I'm always quiet because I feel like talking speech play is very difficult and you often give off much more information than you get from people and you yeah. think you're much more clever than you are. And so mm -hmm. I would urge basically everyone when you're in a hand, just be quiet. In between hands, when I'm not playing, I talk a lot and I, but I don't smack talk actually. I tend to be very friendly because Actually, it makes the game much more pleasant for me because it's nicer to have a pleasant environment at the table. And I often find that I can be the force that changes it when you have a table that's very negative, but someone actually starts pushing a more positive vibe, it often changes. And mm -hmm. I'm actually curious, I'm a journalist. I wanna know about people, I wanna know their stories. I actually am curious about what people have to say about themselves, so I really enjoy it. It also helps me, obviously, because I get information that I can then use when playing against them, but I genuinely enjoy talking to people. Um, I don't smack talk. I will, and I think that this is important, I will call people out. So now that I've become more comfortable in this world and I want the culture to change and I want it to become friendlier for women, um, whenever someone does something that crosses a line, I will call them out. I will call security if I need to. I will call the floor staff and I will make sure that they're penalized for it. That's something I didn't always do, but now I think that... It, you know, if people don't speak out, then the culture will never change. But that's the extent of my smack talk. <laughs> um, M Maria, we always we, we go to to eight o'clock. Um, and I've, I, I neglected to ask you beforehand, if you had a hard out at eight o'clock, would you mind just going a few minutes past? Sure, we can do one more question. We can do one more question. Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll wrap. Um, I'll try to do an easy one. Um, <laughs> no, it, well, actually, this this goes to uh, right to what you just said. Um, what's your thinking about cheaters? 
Oh, um, I that? have, <laughs> people definitely get away with it. Um, oh, I wow. have zero tolerance for it. And I don't understand. I mean, poker to me, the beauty of poker is the beauty of the game, the challenge of it, what it teaches you about thinking, about decision making. Why would you ever play a game and just, and cheat? I mean, why, why do that? I mean, that to me just goes against every single tenet of what it means to to be a poker player. And to me, the reasons why I've, I've come to love the game are antithetical to cheating. So yeah, I have zero tolerance for it. And if I catch someone cheating, believe me, I will call it out and try to bring the community to bear on them because I just, you know, you can, you can make money in lots of ways, but poker, people who get to play poker for a living you're so damn lucky you're playing a game. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's amazing. And if you don't love it, if you don't love the game, if you don't enjoy the experience, why in the world are you doing it? Oh, well, that, that once again, that's life right there again. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I apologize. I, I, I lied. I realized I had a last question. For All you. right, let's, let's go for it. <laughs> can you shuffle the poker chips yet? You were <gasps> trying to learn how to do that. Did you yes. eventually get that dexterity? I'm so proud. Yes, <laughs> okay. I can riffle chips, guys. I can well, do it. I can do it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for, for putting up with my, my last question. Thank you for sharing uh, your experience. Thank you for writing the book. Um, and I just want to tell the audience, uh, if you missed any of this talk, it is being recorded and will be available tomorrow on Skeptical Inquirer's website, skepticalinquirer.org. Our next guest in this series, will be here on February 4th. We welcome Stephanie Kemmerer breaking down the QAnon conspiracy for us. And thanks uh, to Skeptical Inquirer, CFI, and the tech team of the amazing Mark. My name is Leanne Lord, and I thank all of you, but especially you, Maria. This has been one of the most enjoyable um, events that I, I've been a part of. Thank you so much for giving us your time tonight. Thank you so much for doing this, Leanne. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we had a chance to have this conversation. Me too. Me too. You have a very good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.